Well, good morning. So good to see everyone. And so good to see all these books finding new homes. And uh, for those of you who are watching, we're having a dollar a book sale today. And we're also having a continuation of our non-parking lot sale today. We have a lot of marvelous gifts out there. Uh, Cher's already done her Christmas shopping, so you can too. And there's a lot of wonderful things out there to choose from. And if you'd just like to make a donation for our non-parking lot sale, feel free to do so. We're always open to that. We really appreciate everyone who showed up yesterday to help with that. There was singing, dancing, uh, the 360 band, they were just awesome, and a lot of fun things going on. So it was a really great day. Thank you, Bliss team and everyone involved for creating such an unusual day. It was just wonderful. <laughs> Well, if you didn't know, I'm Reverend Mary uh, Mitchell, co-senior minister with Reverend Sue. And our vision, we in inspire and empower people to live spiritually fulfilling lives. And we do that every day, day in and day out. That's our main focus. If you have anything that would beep or ring, we would appreciate it if you would silence it for this time. And we have enough people in here today to wave to all of those at home. So if you would turn around and wave to all our good friends at home, I think they would appreciate seeing who all is here today. It's a really good group. Really good group. And thank you, sound team, for being here early. And Doug and Ronnie for being our greeters at the two entrances. All right, if you're new with us today, uh, if you're here, I don't see new people, but we have friendship packets at the back. And if you're new with us online, come in, come in sometime this week or call us and say, mail me one of those friendship packets and we'll be happy to do that. Have a few invitations. We are doing more. Uh, let's say Reverend Sue is doing more. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. She's going to have the International Day of Peace service to pray for everyone around the world on Monday, September 21st, 7 to 8 p.m. online with Reverend Sue. So if you want to get the, the, um, the Zoom information, give her a ring or email her. And then starting Wednesday, September 23rd, for six weeks, she's doing Revealing Wholeness. This is a brand new course that Home Office has put out. It looks really, really good. Uh, online Zoom on Wednesday evenings, 7 to 9 p.m. The reduced price of $95 ends today, so go ahead and sign up. Otherwise, it'll go up to $115. that will be a really great class. It's going to be um, demonstrating the interrelationships of mind, body, spirit. And then on Thursday, September 24th, Reverend Sue is doing the Yoga of Jesus, and that's another six-week class. Uh, Thursday, 7 to 8.30 p.m. online. And it's the yoga of the Gospels and that Jesus taught these universal principles of God realization to his disciples. So it sounds like a really fascinating class. And then SOAR, Cher and, the, and the, Gary and the team are going on an adventure Saturday to September 26th. They're going to take five short trail crossings of seven scenic bridges. Now say that three times. <laughs> Five short trail crossing seven scenic bridges. Woo! Sounds like a really fun day. Saturday, September 26. What do you usually start that? Um, this one, I have a separate agenda. So separate agenda. agenda. So you need to check with you. Yes. Okay, great. On the Facebook page as well. Great. Great, and then we have a guest, uh, Jolie Eline. She is, her specialty is oaks, oak trees, all about oak trees. And so she's going to be giving a presentation. She'll talk on Sunday, but then from noon to two, she'll do a talk on wisdom of the oaks, food, myth, spirit, and medicine. Noon to two here in the sanctuary. She's an ethnobotanist, that's what it is. And so she weaves ecology, medicine, myth, spirit, and the acorns, the foods of the mighty oaks together. Sounds really fascinating. I think Charlie and Sue found her at the Bioneers conference and uh, said, oh, we gotta have her here sometime. And then uh, Dr. Andrea Azabito is coming with Reverend Sue and they're doing a one day deep heart 
retreat. Portal to our power, Sacred Sisters, it's a day of empowerment. It'll be Saturday, October, 20, October 31st from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m. Registration is $90 before October 1st, and then it'll go to 110. So we wanna get people signed up for those special, really special events. All right, we'll have a reading and then invite the bell. And Reverend Sue is doing a talk on, do you have faith? It should be very interesting. So Damien. Faith, from a small section of writings by Emily Carson in her book, Something Makes Me Open My Eyes. Put your hands together in faith. Fold them and put them down and have faith instead. Faith, not in God, but in your own capacity for light and in your own knowledge of liberation. Faith makes you, makes stepping stones through quicksand. It makes possible what was not so. Faith both lights the way and is the way. And nothing else is needed if faith is proper and right. Perfect faith is perfect Surrender. Perfect faith knows that God will not save you because you need no saving. And light will not desert you because it's already here. Perfect faith is perfect wisdom. It leaves no riddle unanswered. And yet it needs no answers. Perfect faith is sustenance. It is food. It is knowledge of nourishment, the pursuit and completion of that feeding. Perfect faith leads you like no other teacher. It fills in the space between all teachings. It precedes them and it follows them. Perfect faith is perfect composure. Every storm has its eye and every person is faithful. Faith needs no justification to be its own perfect way. It needs nothing but itself. Believe in your own capacity to persevere. Will yourself to love again through all the tightness that seems to block that. And make yourself know that you are human and that will suffice every time. Have faith in the power that resides in your own faults and your own failings. Faith in the knowledge that holds hands with your ignorance. And faith in the one still center that never moves in you and never needs a thing and never asks why. Have faith in what you are already and faith that life continues in you unaltered and unmarred and beyond any stain. And above all, have faith that people just like you do extraordinary things with their lives and you needn't be any exception.
I was having faith. <laughs> oh my. What a magnificent day today is. Clean air, sunshine, open doors, fresh air. Friends we haven't seen in a while. A weekend full of joy and happiness. Knowing we are all one together. Whether you're new with us or you've been with us for a long time at the center, it's one big family. A family brought together in deep spirituality, in deep faith. A faith in this teaching uh, we call science of mind, a faith in the wisdom of the masters from the ages long ago, a faith in the words of Troward, Holmes, Emerson, Thoreau, and on and on and on, all brought together in this philosophy we call science of mind. And so with that faith, my faith in life is strong. My faith in the universe is very strong. My faith in humanity is strong. In this belief, it, it makes me feel grounded. It makes me feel at peace. And it makes me content with the unfoldment in this world. So I rejoice the power of faith in me. I rejoice what it does for me. I rejoice in what it does as I give it to the world. Through this prayer, faith is offered to all to have faith in yourself and faith in your fellow human being. So I let these words flow out from this center in this beautiful fresh air this morning, out into the greater community. We believe in oneness, we believe in the power of prayer, and we are confirmed by our faith. So I let it be, knowing it's already so, and so it is. Reverend Sue. Good morning. So much has been said already just through, through the beautiful reading Damien did, um, honoring Emily Carson and her, her sweet book. And um, this is a continuation, Mary was saying, didn't we just have we been talking about faith? And, and we are, because this whole month in the greater organization is talking about facing fear. And the one powerful ingredient to face fear is faith. It is the antidote. It is the touchstone of, of revelation through whatever, whatever we are going through. So the words that I, I'm eager to share with you, um, they come from one of the books I picked up at randomly in that wonderful pile back there of wisdom books. And it's called um, In the Face of Fear, Buddhist Teachings of Our Challenging Times. Whoever donated that book, um, it's become something I've uh, been loving to, to float through. So I, I thank you for, for bringing that to all of us. So the, the question here is, uh, as we talk about faith, um, I want to keep inviting you to, to check in with yourself. Do, do you have faith? Do you have faith? Because can you recognize yourself in those moments where that flow of faith in you seems to be stagnated? Um, and if you don't understand what, I, what I'm saying right there, let me remind you. Suddenly, you're worried. Suddenly, out of nowhere, you woke up, you felt pretty good, turned on the news, now you're grumbling. Suddenly, you're complaining. Suddenly, you're angry. Suddenly, you're annoyed. Suddenly, something shifts, and your, your heart space feels constricted. Your mind starts to twirl. But just 
I, I love this image, especially with the beautiful imagery that they're able to show us of these hurricane storms, right? You see the, the big cloud and you see the deep, quiet center where nothing happens in that, that ever-present center of, of truth and stability. That's what faith is like inside of us. We have that same downward current, upward current, ever revitalizing and restoring us into a place of harmony and balance with whatever is going on. So some of the clues that you're outside of that and you're starting to be whirled around and whipped around is, is some of those emotional moments. And fear often is what has triggered that. So when we, when we block our faith or somehow manage to be outside of that flow and we've slipped into a place of doubt, we can call it back through prayer, through surrender, to get back in alignment because we slipped on what they call the razor's edge. And you can find that, uh, I still believe, we, we have many conversations, Mary and I do, about what is the future of centers, of, of houses of worship since this COVID experience? Um, it is very comfortable, all you people at home, to stay with your cup of coffee and, and uh, your lounging clothes and just to, to kick back and to listen. And we honor that, we respect that. But there's also something and I think you all feel it here that are in the presence of this room, bound with an energy of love that is tangible. The joy yesterday was very uplifting. I don't dance, but I was dancing because of the 360 band and getting to hear music again and to be in the presence of that and to watch people smile with their eyes, with their masks on. That's pure joy and remembering uh, that that's what this community has built. So I cherish that. And so coming back to this idea of looking at fear and faith this month, because fear is, is a motivator. Remember that. Fear is a motivator. It's not something that we want to continually just ignore because it's something that is moving us into action. It calls for us to clarify what are my true conviction? What is my truth? What is our truth? What is this? And Ernest Holmes reminds us that true faith is so convinced of its own goodness that nothing can sway it. Now, sometimes beliefs can alter, but faith holds an anchor at our core. It is the light that Damien read about from, from this wisdom of this poet and this idea that it is at our very core, this light never leaves us, it's gone nowhere. It does reveal the guidance that we seek. Ernest Holmes also, if one will have faith in himself, really drink this, faith in his fellow man, faith in the universe, faith in God, that faith will light the place in which he finds himself, and by the light of this faith, he will be able to see that all is good. If we can allow these snippets of information, all is good, share Matthew's, it's all love. She relies on that to get her back into alignment with her faith. And when we have these touchstones, these pearls of simple statements, we're pulled right back. It's all good. There is a good unfolding here. I don't see it because it stinks right now, but I'm sure of it. And if we continue to, to really realize that, there's a good unfolding. He goes on and says, And the light shed by this faith will light the way for others. We become conscious of darkness only when we are without our faith. Uh, for faith is ever the light of our day and the light of our way, making that way clearly visible to us, even when to all others it may be set with obstacles and the ongoing seems rough. Science of Mind textbook. Classic, classic paraphrasing of this global idea of faith. Now, Thomas Merton, another... Um, philosopher and teacher that we have used as resource, he, he approaches it this way. God approaches our minds 
God approaches our minds by receding from them. Hmm. We can never fully know God if we think of God as an object to capture, to be fenced in by an enclosure of our own ideas. We know God better after we let God go. We see faith at the, as as the very essence of what we are, this infinite knowingness is living and breathing us. It's just there for us to surrender to and to trust. So often we're asked, um, do you have the faith in God or the faith of God? And ask yourself, am I being faith? Allowing the grace of the all-knowingness to move in me as me. Now, the Centers for Spiritual Living, they give um, guidelines to in encourage a universal thought flowing through all of the Sunday messages. This affirmation, I believe, is, is one of the more beautiful ones that they have shared. So this affirmation, I surrender into the grace of the one, knowing I am divinely guided in all I do. I'd like you to, I'd like you to hear yourself say that, so repeat it. You can say it. Um, I surrender into the grace of the one. I surrender into the grace of the one, knowing I am divinely guided in all I do. I surrender into the grace of the one, knowing I am divinely guided in all I do. More than just words, more than just words, when we allow our, ourselves to find an affirmation of truth, to find a few simple words of a mantra that reconnects us to that holy alignment, we are all the better for it because then we're guided and surrendering into this faith. This calm knowingness is at our core, a calm assurance that all is well, no matter what conditions are temporarily moving through or around us. That calm core, again, is like the eye of the storm, so deep at our center. And faith invites us to look past conditions, past the effects, look past the drama at our times. And remember, there is a goodness unfolding here. And we are a part of that. And faith is calling us into action. Ernest Holmes says, in order to have faith, we must have the conviction that all is well. In order to keep faith, we must allow nothing to enter our thought that will weaken this condition. That will weaken this conviction, is his word. Faith is built up from belief, acceptance, and trust. And whenever anything enters our thought that destroys in any degree one of these attitudes, to that extent, our faith is weakened. Now, this is all Ernest Holmes' wisdom that he has a beautiful chapter on faith in the Science of Mind text. So if you are feeling fragile and torn apart by the different events that 2020 has brought upon us, we are living through it. And we are becoming stronger and wiser through the experiences. The Sikh tradition, we talked about this in Sacred Sisters on Monday. And Valerie Kaur gave a, a beautiful story about her, her teacher, her master teacher, that was wounded in a um, hate crime. And he was shot, paralyzed, and so all he could do was blink eyes. He lived that way for five to seven years post, uh, post that trauma. But what drove him, what drove his family to continue to be in service to him was what they call shardikala relentless optimism, relentless optimism, not Pollyannaism, relentless optimism. And so that made me look into the, the, the optimist creed. Now, many of you were scholars of that several years ago, and you, you took each one of those creed, each one of those statements, and you made a promise to yourself, these are some of them, to be so strong that nothing can disturb your peace of mind to take health, happiness, and prosperity to every person you meet. This is the optimist creed. To make all your friends feel that there is something in them. To look at the sunny side of everything and make your optimism come true. 
to think only of the best, to work only for the best, to expect only the best, to be just as the enthusiastic about the success of others as you are about your own. Forget the mistakes of the past and press on to a greater achievement. Wear a cheerful countenance at all times and get every living creature you meet a smile. How does that feel? That should be the top one. And we're all smiling with these masks and we have to keep reminding each other. I'm smiling. I'm smiling. We were posing for pictures yesterday and we were all smiling behind the mask. And it's, but our eyes light up and the light shines through. So keep on smiling. To give so much time to the improvement of yourself that you have no time to criticize another. To be too large for worry, too noble for anger, too strong for fear, and too happy to, to uh, permit the presence of trouble. To think well of yourself and proclaim this fact to the world. How about that? Can you? I feel so good about myself, I want you to know it. I'm a happening thing. Feel good about it. Say it in, in not so much in, in loud words, no in your deeds, in what you offer out to the world. And finally, to live in a faith that the whole world is on your side, so long as you are true to the best that is in you. That is Larson's words, Optimus Creed. It's nice to have as, as a daily meditation. So we're trusting in this deeper experience, those times where we found ourselves falling into this, this grip of fear, afraid we're going to lose control, finding all the while, ultimately, we are never in control. Don't let that be an, a newsflash to you, but we, we aren't. No matter how much prayer or treatment we do, we're not in control. And the realizing that we're discovering here, this is the surrender that is so beautiful, there is a greater power than we've ever imagined. And this is all something, no, we cannot control it, but it is something that is holding us with great love, no matter what happens, holding us with this calm assurance. All we're asked to do is let go. Let God let go, let it be. There appears to be in the experiences, oftentimes, things that make us feel powerless because we really have no ability to stop change. And we can delude ourselves to think that we're in control, that things are going away, our way. And then suddenly, I was talking to Russell about this with his, his sister had a, uh, a very tragic moment where a slip, a fall, and she was suddenly changed forevermore. But her optimism, her optimism, her spirituality, she is anchored to a truth within her. She is a new and renewed person. So these things happen, these shifts happen, change happens. But the principles of this philosophy are reminding us what that really means, that we cannot control change. We cannot fight for things to be our way, but we can shift our consciousness to approach what is. Presence process, many of you have done that. I am in this now, right, that familiar? Byron Katie, I am loving what is. This is what is. I am loving what is. Eckhart Tolle, be in the now. So life is moving us along in these various currents of experiences with joy and sorrow as you think of the hurricane swirling in the tides of our experience. One major swerve, one major challenge, and we're flung into a new obstacle. Now, what I'm eager to share, and, I, and I'm, I might be reading them quite a bit here, but these are Sharon Salzberg's writings, and they're so brilliant. They're so heart-touching. I can't help but want to bring them forward. We cannot wake up each day, she said, and decide what we will encounter. We can't decide what we're going to feel and be confronted by during the day but we can infect the, and influence and impact what happens through our consciousness, but we cannot control the unfolding of experiences. So her story of the suddenness of change, oh, um, often when we're feeling utterly helpless, spinning out of control, our response first is fear, and that's natural. That's the natural response. But then she said, our fear 
can limit our response. We fail to see past our assumptions and our visions of something greater. And so we're feeling constricted in those moments and it strangles our creativity. We want to insist it to be another way. We want to tighten up and try to pull away and to deny what is happening because it's just too hard to look at. And feel this in your own story. We've all got those gut-wrenching moments in our life experience. We are human beings learning these tools of truth. So notice those times when you withdrew, when you felt that hint of uncertainty and the riskiness when you were called into something that you have never, ever experienced before. COVID. We were all, that was a, a universal, around the planet experience. Everyone was thrown into it. And we've all been realizing that we slipped out of a flow of life that we had become so accustomed to. And we contracted. And it was overwhelming for a while. And we turned into ways, sometimes some of us tried to numb it, we cut ourselves off from what is happening, and only further, we locked ourselves into a grip of fear. But then we come back to a faith. And in contrast, Sharon says, faith reminds us of the ever-changing flow of life with all its movement and possibility. Faith, these are beautiful words, is the capacity of the heart that allows us to draw close to the present and find there the underlying thread connecting that moment's experience to the fabric of all of life. It opens us to a bigger sense of who we are and what we are capable of doing. So she said, um, in the, she started sharing her story just by visiting a, a museum and looking, those of you who are then into art, looking at Van Gogh's art, watching some of it so beautiful and light and bright and other it has dark, shadowy stuff. And she realized, you know, the mood swings, the, the, the way he was able to, to capture those moments and to, to put them on a canvas. And so she was very moved walking through the museum and then she kind of was an altered reality when she went to the gift store and she saw all these little mouse pads and little hand towels that you can buy and take home. And, and she said people were trying to get that experience, capture it on a souvenir and put it somewhere in their house to remember. Nothing wrong with that. I've got a lot of souvenirs. But um, she just, this idea, she said, that in these moments we still have to travel through those dark moments to find our way to the light because the light is calling us forward. So she aligns the story with the time when one of her friends had severe asthma and bronchitis and, and she said she came down herself during that winter, a bad case of the flu. I continued to travel and teach until that flu turned to bronchitis so severe that I broke a rib coughing. One evening when I was on the verge of another relapse, some friend took me to an outdoor mineral bath, supposedly healing waters. We sat together in, in that warm water, looking at the stars, enjoying easy, rambling talk. After a while, the topic turned to fear and how often it arises when we realize we're not in control. We each told stories where we faced fear and how we handled it, gracefully or poorly, and almost nonchalantly, I commented, it feels like it's been a very long time since I experienced acute, intense fear right down to my bones. Because of the great serenity I had developed through meditation, I actually thought I had fear under control, that it was something I used to deal with a long time ago in my distant past. And it, in terms of debilitating, crushing fear, I believe, oh, never again, never again. But in just two hours later, that bronchitis turned to asthma, and it was the first asthma attack of her entire life. She trembled, unable to breathe, and she thought, in fact, that she was dying. The air seemed to be changed into a viscous substance too thick to inhale, an astonishing primal physical anxiety coursed through me, gasping for air. Having the image of her friend in the hospital with the pneumonia came to mind, and she had another terrible conviction that, yes, he might die, overwhelmed of the, of the vision of anyone struggling with the futility to breathe, struggling until death. I realized that 
is me now. Sure enough, that fear went right to my bones. So she realized in those moments, do you see the constriction as you hear that story? And maybe you're recalling some of the moments there were you as well in those moments of terrifying uh, revelation that this is happening. You know, for, for Reverend Andy, I still am haunted by the stories he shares of his wife having to drive through the Paradise Fires. He was in Chico, but this fear was gripping him his wife had to drive through the fires and p picking up strangers along the course of people just wild with, with fear and frenzy. And you realize, what brings us back? These are this sense of being trapped, being constricted into fear. And then where does, the, where does faith emerge again? It took her moments to recall different spiritual truths that started to surface inside of her, that started to soften her surrender to the one, to surrender to a greater idea, something greater has this, and suddenly she was able to breathe, to take another breath, and suddenly faith had restored her to a place of, of perfect harmony with, with what was going on. She is a very close friend of Ram Dass, and his tragedy of his stroke struck her and his friends so severely because we all love those Ram Dass fans. Storm, I'm talking to you. The, the idea of uh, this man, this articulate, witty man that was able to take spiritual truths and feed them back to us with humor and wisdom, and they stuck because of his way of articulating the truth. So she realized suddenly in those moments the great grief that overwhelmed her during those hours following the news of his stroke, the friends gathered at her house. They wanted Ramdas to recover. Notice how we try to control the outcome. I wanted Ramdas to recover from the stroke, looking and acting just the way he looked and acted before. Marion, I want the center to come back and look like just like it was before COVID. We can't control that. We can't do that. I wanted him walking, funny, brilliant. I might have called my response true hope, but it was actually a fixated hope, a conditional hope. And fear kept me from letting go into the reality that Ramdas was immobile, unable to communicate, and facing an uncertain outcome. Throughout the course of that night, I, she said, I sat by his side with fear. And as I acknowledged it, Befriending myself, despite the fear, my heart began to open, and I met the unknown with a strategic plan, without a strategic plan of control. Surrender. I let go. I let go into even this, and I allow it to that which is greater, that greater light, to move me, to heal me, to guide us. So no longer was the fear dominating her mind, but her love for Ramdas was clearly arising, and loving him did not depend on a fixated hope of his recovery. The power of love would not shatter in the face of change. I love that. The power of love would not shatter in the face of change or disintegrate in the wash of my own ter terror. And they all fell silent, each with their own thoughts of Ramdas. And then Mirabai Bush, some of us know her, there is a time for faith, she said, here and now we have entered the mystery. And they each accepted the fact that Ram Dass stroke and surrendered their ability to control the situation. And they felt a tangible peace suddenly fill the room. None of us expected that, she said. But faith allowed us to relax into the vast space of not knowing. Even as I felt the ache of sorrow, I remembered life is bigger. And even though there's drastically changing circumstances, you can look around and see all that are gathered there and cherish the refuge of Sangha, of community. 
which has continually helped open us all to a greater truth. This idea of opening to what is and to let go of control, sometimes that final step of treatment, that fifth step, and so it is. I release this now and let it go. There's where we invest our heart the greatest. I really do let go. I let it be. And she, she said, faith enables us, despite the fear, to get as close to the truth of a present moment so that we can offer our hearts fully to it with integrity. Now, many of us have, have felt a, a divided America. And now is the time to open our hearts to each other with integrity. We can have our hope. We can have our principles. But let our hearts remain open to one another. This is so important. If we can get this over the next few months to hold each other in that container of hope that allows us to engage and not try to control the outcomes here. A willingness to engage with life, she says, which means the unknown and not to shrink back from it, not to be afraid, not to be afraid to love bigger. So in closing this idea, she said, so it is with faith, that long night. She realized that for me to meet Ram Dass's stroke with faith instead of fear would mean experiencing him fully as he was, as he continued to change. It would mean that if I realized there was little I could do to help him, I would not abandon him so as to avoid getting hurt if it didn't go well. With faith, I could stay connected to him and not let despair allow me to be powerless in the way of my loving him. To act with faith would mean learning to care about Ram Dass in a way not based on language, mobility, or even him staying alive. The closeness, the understanding, the devotion of love would not diminish in letting go. It would not diminish in letting go. Let our love not diminish for one another as times shift into an area that we really do not, do not know the outcome. And now, as he progressed, we all know that he um, is still a fabulous teacher. It takes him longer to grasp his words that he wants to communicate to us. And she, so she said, having faith does not mean that we don't make an effort. We pour ourselves into that endeavor and do our best to accomplish, doing our absolute best to speak, to heal, to create, to alleviate suffering. And that faith allows us to make an intensity of effort guided by a more holistic vision of life and to allow ourselves just to be continual, continually held in the eye of the storm, in that place of deep love. Now, Ram Dass admitted that it took him a long time to find one word to articulate. Now, he had a pattern, uh, Charlie and I have talked about this before, he had a pattern of being slow and sometimes in, in way before the stroke of searching just the right words, but when it came out, it was just a story that just uh, you took home with you forever. But he, he said, um, he, he asked her later, a year later, they were in conversation, just sitting and being, and he asked her, she was writing this book about faith, and he asked her how it was going, and she said, it's, it's not as easy as I thought. And she said, I'm, I'm finding that, um, I'm, I'm struggling to find the words to put to a truth. And he, he responded to her in saying that, welcome to his world. He has to go very deep to find even one word. We all have to go very deep to touch our faith. It's right there. But when we are constricted, the invitation is to go deeper. Be with what is happening. Be with it. Don't run away. 
We, are, we have said this many times, we are made for this. This philosophy is an inspiration of a touchstone of power and truth for all of us. And there is a mystery unfolding here. And we are made for these times. We've been through many generations of change. And there is a good unfolding. It's always unfolding. We are in that at every moment. So the idea, I surrender into the grace of the one, knowing I'm divinely guided in all I do. Can I hear that from you again? I surrender into the grace of the one. Surrender into the grace of the one, knowing I am divinely guided in all I do. Feel that in the murmuring. Can you imagine the murmuring that is going on in the planted as we, as, we, and as we all murmur our prayers? Hear it again. I surrender into the grace of the knowing of the one. Okay, I surrender into the grace of the one knowing I am divinely guided in all I do. Go for it. I surrender this one knowing. Oh, to me, that takes me to my heart. I can hear Dick. I can hear Nadine. I can hear Peg. I can hear, I can hear you. The divine hears that call, that call of our love, knowing that as we release and let go, we become filled with a courage in our heart. Whatever takes us to the edge of our outer limit leads us. Do you see that? It leads us back to the mystery and we find our faith. None of us know what is happening here. And when we have that moment of opening to what is actually happening at any given moment rather than running from it, we're increasingly aware of our lives as one small part of a vast fabric of a shimmering pattern of turnings and changing. And we're all a part of that dance as we lean into our faith. So as I close this time, I just invite you to, to look deeply into your own way, to look at your uh, relentless optimism, to look in, in your, uh, your creed of truth, to see which ones actually speak to you. And in lieu of a prayer, I'm sharing, inviting you into her prayer, a meditation from Emily Carson. So adjust your posture and hear these words spoken directly to the very core self in you that knew this all along and is patting you on the back saying, well done, my dear, well done. Close your eyes and join me. There is only one. Keep faith in yourself. Keep alive the understanding that you are still here and can still persist. That though you fight, you will not always do so. And though you despair, you will one day find hope. There is a need for optimism, a requirement that you know that things are unfolding. Nothing is ever smooth going, but the things always get better. A requirement that you know that light is in you, ahead of you, around you, and you're moving inevitably within it, through it. If you know this, there's a realism. And when you do not, there's despair. An invention of the mind too afraid to know a truth. Have faith. You must have faith that the best things in life happen to everyone and you're no exception. That the brightest luck is available to all people equally, it's available to you. Have faith, have faith in yourself. And that kind of faith, not to believe that you're doing everything well, it is to know that the road of your self-discovery becomes brighter, that persistence is always rewarded and that everything is learned. Faith is the realization that no one is exempt from the process of becoming, and that process is already unfolding. 
It is faith that gives you the courage to do something differently. Faith makes it possible to change. It unleashes in you a power of your own will directed towards your own healing. It gives you a foundation. It steadies you when you falter. Faith rises in each and every one of us from the same well. It springs like water from the same ground source. And there are cracks in the hearts and the minds of every person which allow it to permeate and percolate. Faith is the property of every human being, a part of the essence of humanity. And so you already have it. You already have it. It need not be created. It is not a new belief you must construct. It's something you already feel, something you already know that has substance and power, something tangible and subtle. And so faith, being already yours, cannot leave you, can never abandon you. Belief in what you already have, though you sometimes call it knowingness and sometimes inspiration, believe in the fact that things always heal, that expansion is inevitable, and that you cannot fight forever. And pray. And pray, and when you do pray, that faith will wash clean your sight, and you will see things from the brightness that they already are, and know that the future for healing is already here. Let faith be yours, it is, I tell you already. Allow what you know of the brightness to counter despair and dampen some of your protests and lead you where you thought you could not go. We're all headed into the sunlight, no matter where you think life has pointed you. I guarantee that is the direction you will walk in, to the light. There is no darkness that your eyes can behold, which will not one day appear exactly as it is. And that is simply a place where you did not see the sun, not the place where the sun was absent. You will know this for yourself. Have faith. Sometimes it is all you have to go on, but it's enough. And it's already yours. In gratitude for Emily Carson, for Ernest Holmes, for Sharon Salzberg, for Ram Dass, for Mirabai Bush, for this teaching, for this platform. And now we say thank you, God. And we really, today of all days, we let go and we smile. And so it is. Thank you for listening. I can see why you were excited about that. Great message, great message, and really super book. I have to look for that. All right, it's time for the offering. Aren't you excited? Yes, yeah. Oh, huh? <laughs> So if you would repeat after me, gratefully I give with an attitude of abundance. For I know as I give, I do receive. And so it is. It's so true, isn't it? So we have our offering baskets at both exits, so just drop it in there. And we really, really appreciate it. You know, uh, March seems like a long time ago when we had to close things up. And we are as healthy today as we were then. And it's because of you and all the fabulous support we've received and a, a couple of hopefully forgivable uh, donations from the government under the Payroll Protection Act. And we're really grateful entering the fourth quarter in such good shape. So I'm, I'm happy to report that. And so as you leave, we, well, we have some music from Damien, don't we? Oh. Who? What's the difference? <laughs> we get you guys mixed up. Down in the valley to pray. So take the music in. Be sure and grab a few more books on your way out and have a wonderful week. As I went down in the valley to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, brothers, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, brothers, let's go down, down in the valley to pray. 
As I went down in the valley to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, sisters, let's go down, let's go down, come on down. Oh, sisters, let's go down, down in the valley to pray. As I went down in the valley to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe and crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, fathers, let's go down. Come on down, don't you want to go down? Come on, fathers, let's go down, down in the valley to pray. As I went down in the valley to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the starry crown? Good Lord, show me the way. Oh, mothers, let's go down. Come on down, don't you want to go down? Come on, mothers, let's go down, down in the valley to pray. As I went down in the valley to pray, studying about that good old way, and who shall wear the robe?